But did he bring cookies? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. There are cookies. Well, we we can we can get started then. Thank you, uh, Randy, for getting that going. Um, welcome everybody to the uh, the Astro Cafe for Monday, March the eighteenth. Um, it's been a few uh, clear nights, and I've seen a lot of chatter about um, some photographs. So hopefully, uh, some people will have some things uh, queued up that we can have a look at. Uh, we also have a guest uh, today. Uh, I was informed, uh, Alistair. I think you're in the um, uh, in the Fairfield room. Wonderful. Um, I, I was going to give you the spot of honor here, Alistair, to uh, to start us off and talk about the scope uh, in Edmonton, if you're okay with that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, is the volume okay here? Yeah, you sound great. So, Alistair, I'm your dutiful page turner. I'm just going to shift over to the second screen I have. Hey, where you go? Oh, they're gonna drag. Yeah, you. hold on a second. Off. There we are. See now you can see it. Right. Okay. And how about the little things down in the corner? Is that? Don't know. If those oh, are... am I am I sharing the wrong thing? Just a sec no, here. Not the main thing, but there's also two mini windows, Zoom and Zoom meeting. Yeah, I'm sharing the wrong screen. So just let me. Oh, that's that's, that's well, you know, it's it's okay. Yeah, just that, just that. I'll, I'll do the, hopefully I'll do the right thing here. Actually, exit. Let's see if it will go away. Maybe the exit. Or I'm not there. No, I guess. Let's see. If Hold you on can a... that, it looks okay, David. I mean, it looks okay. Maybe. Okay. Oh, there I mean, you go. We'll it didn't go away, away. I think it was on, for some reason, it was on our end. We were seeing that bit. Do you see a full screen now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, uh, uh, I guess a short introduction of uh, myself, a uh, member of the Edmonton Centre now since, uh, uh, well, I guess 1987, uh, joined the RESC back when I was uh, 15, uh, back in Montreal, uh, and then uh, it, it, there, there's a, a plethora of, you know, wonderful mentors that I was very fortunate to have. Um, and of course, the, the RESC family is just a, a fantastic uh, family to have. And so uh, uh, I learned a lot. And uh, uh, so, uh, well, uh, my, my mom is here in Victoria, which is why I'm here. I'm visiting her. Uh, so, so three times a year-ish, I come to Victoria. And uh, so it's really nice to uh, uh, enlarging the the family, the RESC family that uh, that I already have uh, with uh, new faces. So it, it's always uh, uh, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, share uh, astronomy with uh, like-minded people. And You're welcome here permanently anytime. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I will need first a grandchild and then for their parents to move here before oh, I move here. I mean, he was only in Edmonton about three years before I was. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, uh, let's uh, um, uh, start away at it. The um, Some of you have already seen a presentation from uh, Dave Robinson about the uh, Black Nugget Lake Observatory. So I'll keep things sort of short on the observatory itself. But uh, next page, please, David. Um, um, it's uh, a, 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 a sort of a long history that can be uh, sort of sh well shortened for the purposes of the presentation. It's a uh, 32 inch uh, diameter, 0.8 meter, uh, folded uh, Newtonian in Alpaz Drive. Uh, the uh, key funding we couldn't have done it without uh, uh, Bob Drew, who is uh, local here now. Uh, yeah, we just uh, could not have done it without his uh, very generous uh, donation. And likewise, we could not have done it without the uh, engineering, machining, and design from uh, uh, master builder Roman uh, Eunuch. Uh, there, we got some wonderful donations from uh, the University of Alberta, the, the dome and the warm-up uh, ATCO trailer, uh, but also uh, design in part, uh, <laughs> Dave... Uh, Robinson before uh, he left uh, uh, to come out here, but uh, the, a whole committee of people 
uh, putting in hundreds and hundreds uh, of hours. And uh, a key part of this was the gamblers of Alberta uh, spending their money at casinos. And uh, mm -hmm. we volunteer and get a nice little cut. Uh, and we have to spend this in, in the interest of the public. So it's not a members only facility. We do uh, are required um, to make it all uh, copacetic uh, that uh, we put on uh, public star nights as well. Uh, but uh, some uh, uh, companies were uh, really good. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, we need a crane to lift the, the thing through. And there's a company that was more than happy to actually, oh, we'll just do it for you. Don't, don't worry about invoices or whatever. It's just, it's too small a job to actually invoice. So <laughs> we'll just, you know, it, it's great to have the, the community going. So there, there's uh, community stuff that I, I, I haven't mentioned. But uh, here we are. So uh, next, please. Uh, we're located to the southeast of Edmonton. Uh, if you look northwest, which is uh, the picture on the right, is actually uh, pointing uh, pretty close to west southwest. So the light dome of Edmonton, you can see shining through the trees there. So it's not horrible to the west that the uh, light pollution maps <laughs> makes it appear. But uh, nonetheless, you try not to observe too many things to the west, and you try and observe most of what you want uh, to the uh, eastern half of, uh, of the sky, and, and obviously uh, high up. So for uh, many of us, uh, from uh, sort of central to slightly western Edmonton, it's about a one-hour drive uh, to get to here. Uh, and um, okay, so uh, that, that sort of gives you a little bit of uh, perspective. And as you can see from the picture, uh, that uh, it, it's a pretty nice sky. Uh, there are darker sights, of course, as you can see to the Southeast, um, but um, everything is a, a balance. Uh, Warren Finley did a great job in, in uh, sleuthing out uh, the uh, appropriate place that's you know, not too far, not too close, uh, and has amenities. We have a heated biffy, uh, which is <laughs> uh, so not just a warm up hut, but a, a place where you can sit down when it's minus twenty and not go. Woo! Um, better, better than the wind one at Blackfoot. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Next, please. And so a, a key part of this, um, uh, it, it was not stipulated by Bob Drew when he donated it, because when he donated the mirror, it was the do, do what you will with the mirror, but uh, you know, know that I come from a line of visual observing and I would like it to be uh, to visual uh, for visual use. And it just so happens that the people who stepped forward, well, this is now 10 years ago, <laughs> at the start of all this, uh, were mainly visual observers. And so this is uh, how it is, as you can see in the eyepiece at, uh, sort of uh, just above center right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's it, uh, you know, two inch uh, focuser. Uh, now, of course, the design is such that it's um, upgradable, modular. So at some point, there's going to be no issue throwing on a, a rotating focuser or uh, imaging assembly. Uh, and uh, But there's no internet at the moment uh, either. So it, it's uh, kind of OK. Um, we, we are located on a, uh, a well, it, it's a county land, but that's leased out to a provincial park operator. And so during the summer months, uh, the, the actual campsites that our observatory is located on, someone can just say, oh, I want campsite 75 uh, with their RV. And we are not allowed to walk on to the site and go into the dome. That is not permitted. Uh, but it's okay because in summer it's it's not dark. Uh, it's very twilighty, uh, uh, permanent twilight as we like to call it. Um, but uh, when it comes to the September star party, some of the uh, the part of the agreement is that yeah we rent out the entire north side of the camp uh, of the campground, and so then it's ours. 
Uh, but otherwise, October to May, we have entry through a separate gate and we're uh, free to use uh, the site. Um, but uh, running such a facility, you need um, to be uh, aware of limited spacing. Uh, we can only have three people in the dome. The dome with this picture looks larger than it really is. Uh, but um, like if, if the telescope was pointed down uh, where Luca is currently standing, it would hit him. It just fits. Mm. Um, and so what happens like if there's just no place for the fourth person? No. Technically, we can put a fourth person in there, but, yes. But that would be it. But, 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 but it's yeah. also, I think the uh, fire regulations are, is four people. And then, of course, that's based on the size of the case. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and you don't take out your forehead on the way out as well. Um, but the, the other thing is, as well, the more people you crowd in, you just have heat related problems because there's <laughs> only one exit out uh, out the chimney uh, um, of, of the open dome um, and so Alistair, there needs yes? Alistair, if if this is on a grounds that's used for camping by public are there are there any security concerns that you folks have with with the equipment itself uh, within reason, uh, you know, nothing is secure in any absolute kind of sense. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, fenced in gates with locks, but uh, just like, you know, with any even reasonably secure facility, if someone really wants to get in, they will. Yeah, no, I asked because we're, we're facing potential um... Uh, question about insurance for for our property and our property is up up on the observatory hill this one seems situated in a public area and, and you know although the fence certainly looks like a you know performa fence it, i mean it's, it's not really that high but you guys haven't had problems with that at all not as yet no um okay i don't want to don't suggest things but i, I just was yeah, curious no, uh, the, the um the the grounds are gated but hey, anybody can jump a gate. There, you know, there's no razor wire <laughs> around things. But technically, it's in the remainder of the site is in control of the campground operator. Just a little louder, please. If if I didn't, oh no, yeah, the the uh, caps campsites on that site, including the ones that are used when the, the our, our club is not there, are all under the responsibility of the campground operator. Who has a contract with the county? And does that continue so all security, year? Security overall is okay. responsibility of the county. And they're there, yeah, they're checking it all the time. They're well, they're no, rolling, no, but yeah. they're they're there. It's it's a fair ways from the county office, in right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so uh, it, it's but it but it's uh, it's farmland. There there is a golf course next door, and we actually there's a protocol for us to be able to. Uh, phone in and have the lights to the golf course turned off. So that's that's uh, very nice. They've been good about that too. Uh, but it, it's yeah, it's agricultural land as far as the eye can see. Uh, so it, it's uh, uh, pretty dark in that respect. And there's sort of no reason for ne'er do wells to be going running around there. It's pretty far off of any uh, any of the small towns are still the main highway is. It is still about uh, uh, six or seven kilometers from the site. So, but yeah, the, you, you just kind of fingers crossed. We carry insurance and you just hope for the best. Okay. Um, okay, uh, next please. So uh, what have I seen? Uh, the, the main topic of tonight, uh, what does it look, you know, what, what do you see when you look through one of these wonderful instruments? Um, I've uh, only had uh, three, I think, uh, sessions with it, some of them short, uh, like at the star party where lineups are long, or it's just best to wait till 1 a.m. till the crowds spin <laughs> out. Um, and, um, you know, like things I have not seen M57. Um, so there, I have not seen the Whirlpool Galaxy. I'm looking forward to trying that uh, um, as we approach New Moon coming up. Uh, so there's a, a you know some very big marquee objects that uh, I yeah I, I'm very very keen to see. So haven't seen everything yet, um, and of course 
uh, well, I'll, I'll get into it later. Uh, some You're at the mercy of uh, the weather and the sky conditions. So uh, next, please. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start on. Uh, one of the, uh, 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 well, marquee objects is the Crescent Nebula, Van Gogh's ear. And uh, uh, th this sketch made by uh, Berta Beltran is an indication of the sort of thing uh, you would see uh, through it. Um, but was, was this drawn black and white as the negative of it? Or? No, it's drawn white on black. Wow. Yeah, Berta's Bert been uh, working hard at, uh, at doing that. Uh, she also does black on, on white, but this was one of them. Um, but like anything else, it's the, uh, you know, you have 10 minutes, go. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe this one was a little bit longer. But uh, when when I look through uh, at it, uh, the central area is just, it's mottled. There, it's just, oh my, there, it's not just this one arc with tendrils. It's like, oh, it, it, it's, they're, 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 it's built. Um, and and, uh, and so trying to sketch something like that, it, it, it's, uh, would be very difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, the O3 filter is, uh, is the real thing. Uh, that, that really um, brings your contrast in, uh, as, as many of you would know by looking at uh, uh, some of those wonderful emission objects up there. Uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm trying to, uh, you know, deliberately uh, uh, take an image off the internet and then do a little bit of uh, manipulation to try and indicate what this thing is really. It's a lot fainter than this, Einstein's cross. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with gravitationally lensed objects, a really massive central galaxy will bend the light from objects behind it if it's perfectly centered, you get an Einstein ring of light of the object from behind. Sometimes you get two spots, sometimes you get four. So we were able to manage just picking out the north and south components, which are the brighter two of the four. And uh, it's the, well, we're going to go back and have a look. But it, it's one of those things where um, this is really only for, I was going to say hardened visual observers, but you know, those who really appreciate it, because it's like right at the limit, you look in and, and you go, where is it? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Just off center to the right. Uh, um, may, oh, oh, may, oh, yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, but you, you know, for us, it's that this is a quasar 8 billion light years away. You know, how, Mind blowing is that. Is that uh, likely the furthest that anybody's ever seen with their eyes? Probably. I, I mean, someone looking through an even bigger telescope may have gone to that chance, or... but no. <laughs> so, this will be one of the ones that would be among the most famous and, and sought after ones. Yeah. And, Alistair, is it go to, or did you have to start up to find that? Um, it, it's both. Uh, the, the, the current software it is very much go-to, but this object is not in the list of objects. Uh -huh. right. So we have to go to, uh, you know, HD89753 and then yeah. using Sky yeah, Safari. Yeah. Okay, we need to, you see that star over there? Yeah, we need to hop about two more times past that to... Go close. Damn high. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we, there, um, it's in progress that people are looking to see how to either swap out the software uh, for the drives or to be able to get something like Sky Safari to just go, go to, and have it all uh, figured out. So we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> next, please. Mm. Uh, the veil. Ah. Uh, <laughs> The, the, uh, I've taken images off the internet and played with the contrast and, and, and that, but that is relatively close to what you see through. It, it, it's, you look in and, you know, many of you have had a chance to see it through the 20 inch, um, I, I'm sure. And, and, you know, it's 
And when you compare it, oh, I've seen it through the 10 inch and the 20 and then the 30, it's just, you look in and the the um, the long term uh, visual observer just goes ha, 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 oh god you, you know it's just like uh, you, you know it's like well words fail when trying to you know and it's just like I don't think I'd possibly be able to do sketches and you, you, like the components that you see here um the the ones that, who are familiar with these objects know that these objects well there's you know four times more stuff than than this and and then it's like oh oh next please uh, sorry you it's time for you to leave and the next person to have a look so, but, but 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 i i, I want to see this other next time thank you uh so when it's uh, when it's a public night you you get a, a two minute jolt of just ah uh, <laughs> uh, yeah the, the 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 detail that you can see is absolutely stunning and it, you know it's well worth you know the the whatever time amount of time you've had to to wait to to look at it. That said, as I thought, there's a little um, uh, a reminder. Um, uh, Roman um, had uh, a friend with him, a non-astronomy friend, and you know he looked through the telescope at this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose that's nice. <laughs> you know, a lifetime of non-appreciation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Uh, next, please. But it, it sort of shows you that. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're if you haven't had the the, the preconceived notions, the the knock your socks off, you know that isn't it, and it's just like I, I, I <laughs> what else can you do? It's it's so amazing. Um, but one one of the things we discovered uh, fairly quickly, and this is not a fair representation. I really didn't have time for it, but something like this is Messier thirty six in Riga, where. You know, an eight-inch scope, a ten-inch scope will show you what's on the left there, and you go, "Wow, what a pretty object!" And then you look uh, through uh, the the main scope, and you're looking through the central core. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can't remember. Do you, Dave? Do you know what low power is on it? Is it? It's yeah. like 125 or something oh. like that. Oh. So your classic star Messier star clusters are not at all impressive because you're looking right through them. Similar to how uh, a big telescope, uh, amateur telescope uh, looks at say the beehive star cluster. It's like you're missing you know, five sixths of the object because you're looking right through it. Um, the seeing uh, is much better than the uh, image at right. <laughs> um, we, we've, but, we, uh, uh, being in central Alberta next to the Rockies, a lot of times the seeing is only th you know, three arc seconds. Well, <laughs> uh, but the stars are nice, are as round as you can get them. So we know we're collimated and, and that kind of thing. And of course, there's more color than what you would see on the right. Uh, next, please, David. Uh, so, uh, of course, the, the keen deep sky observers, uh, it's just like, oh, there's a planetary nebula in globular cluster Bessier 15. we got to go for that. And um, for those of uh, us who have actually seen it in smaller telescopes, uh, it's a challenge. Like, first picked it up in the 12 and a half inch scope. Uh, and, and the M15 is so symmetrical. You really have to know there's like that trapezoid Somebody else is already showing how to star hop into um, it. Uh, and, you know, boom, there it is. It was um, my observation was, boy, it's a lot fluffier than I remember ever seeing it. So it's like, it's, you know, once somebody goes, oh, yeah, you know, just to the, the lower left, the center, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, there's this blob there that, that is not a star. So it's actually, um, uh, super easy in in this scope. Okay, next, please. Uh, and and the short of it, though, uh, the objects that are killers in in an, uh, in a scope this big are the planetary nebula, because uh, you're not looking through them. The planetaries generally are are relatively small, and so they and they can hold a lot of magnification because quite often they're small but they're bright. 
so you can afford to magnify and magnify up to a reasonable scale. So something like uh, NGC 40, it's actually prettier than this picture. Uh, it's and, and it's like, yeah, it's it's kind of blue greeny. Um, uh, and uh, things like the Snowball Nebula, um, uh, NGC 7662 up in Andromeda, the, the first impression was, oh, hey, that's bright. Uh, you know, it's like we need more power or we need to filter it to, to cut down the amount of light coming through because it's just it's so staggeringly bright. Uh, it's actually hard to see details. But it's hey, some Alistair, so you're usually using it without filters. And it depends. For something like a, uh, a planetary where we go, oh, we know this is an emission line object, in goes the filter. Okay. And, and that way it really blackens out the sky. And I'll be getting to that in, in, a, in a couple of slides. Um, next, please, David. <clears throat> so at some point it was like, oh, got to do the little dumbbell. Because of course, the big dumbbell is big, but the little dumbbell, and it's like, it's actually, again, it's better than this. It's, you see the wings and that central bar is just like, oh, there, there, there's just detail all over the place. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's not just, oh, there's a rectangular-ish blob in the middle. It's like, no, it's, it, you can see the sharper edges here, the softer edges there. You can see that some areas are brighter, fainter, and it's just, it, it, it's detail and detail and detail. It's just marvelous. And again, with the O3 filter. So I've kind of tried to tint this green. I couldn't quite mm -hmm. get it uh, um, as is, but it's like, oh, it, it's it's green. Uh, so next, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, someone said, oh, we've got to do the crab. So it's like, sure, yeah, yeah, we've got to do the crab. Uh, so this is sort of what I had in my head as we were going in, something like this. Uh, one of our uh, observers, um, Abdur Anwar, does some great astro imaging. He goes, oh, you should try an O3 filter. And it's like, why? The crab is synchrotron radiation. It's full spectrum. They're, they're... And he goes, yeah, just, just try it. So next shot. And uh, I don't, uh, next image, please. Oh, it, it's oh. like, it's like that <laughs> in, it, with the O3 filter. It's just, there are lines and ridges and, and, and stuff, again, all over the place. And just like, you know, it's not just some kind of central feature with something brighter. It's just, again, stuff, stuff, stuff all over the place. So it would, it, it's just, you know, like, oh, I didn't realize it had that much, you know, O3 emission. You know, what do you know? And it's just like, that, that, that is a super cool object. Uh, one of the things we have not done, well, maybe someone in our club has, I have not heard uh, whether they've actually seen the crab pulsar. So somewhere starting in that 30 inch, they say that um, some people should be sensitive enough to catch the, you know, the flicker of 30, because, you mm -hmm. know, if you've ever seen lights flicker at, at 40 or 50 hertz, well, this is at 30 hertz, so mm -hmm. yeah, you, should, you might be, I, so I've heard that some people have done it, um, and uh, some people have even gone to the extent, I, I think it was Griffith Observatory in LA, uh, someone had a little um, LCD box that they uh, uh, made that would be that they could change the frequency of you know on off on off and so they could get it so that you could get this sort of beat pattern with the pulsar and just have it pop in once a second and go oh yeah that's that's it so maybe we'll we'll, we'll get there so that that's uh, uh, on my hope to see one day is the, the crowd pulsar blinking. Uh, so it sounds like it's uh, possible. Uh, it would be an interesting challenge for an epileptic to be the first person to look at the seizure from the crowd pulsar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, please, David. Um, planets, boy, that, it's, it's a tough one. Um, Saturn was already kind of getting low by the time uh, we got the, the scope going. Um, 
uh, deliberately uh, oversaturated uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, um, image taken by one of our uh, Edmonton members um, to to kind of the the uh, you you sort of say uh, you expect to see the light coming out through the back of the observer's head. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's like, it is so bright. Uh, and at one point it's like, holy smokes, you sort of rear back a bit and on the on the dome projected, oh, there, there's Jupiter, maybe you should just project focus it better on the dome <laughs> up there. It's, it's a lot easier on your eyes. Um, but uh, as I said there, the, 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 the trouble is getting good seeing. If it's three arc seconds, it, it's, it's mushy. Uh, and uh, you know, brighter mush does not help. Uh, but um, not too far from Jupiter, as, as, as you all know, uh, at this time of year, uh, Uranus has been trolling the background of the sky. And so at one point um, I brought in a, um, an eyepiece with a little occulting bar right at the uh, field stop. We blocked Uranus and we were able to relatively straightforward find three of the, the moons of, uh, of Uranus. So yeah, that's a start. We know there are more and we should be able to get them. Uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, what we were able to do uh, late one night uh, in in September. So uh, yeah, haven't seen Saturn yet. Haven't even seen the Saturn Nebula yet. Uh, so looking forward to that as well. Uh, next, please. Ah, uh, um, <laughs> the edge on NGC eight ninety one uh, near uh, Gamma Andromeda. Uh, Again, not not really. It's not not for the public. I I wouldn't say that, but it's they they would look in and and w again wouldn't really appreciate what they're looking at. So I've taken a picture here and desaturated the color out of it, so it's much more closer. Now we can't quite see the fine structure that's that you can see on this image. But you can see that you know it is not a uniform dark lane. It's there's stuff again in it, and um, but to to us as observers, this is one of the oh you you have to see this because we've all seen it in our eight inch or ten inch or twelve inch scopes, and and just like oh you know that's not nice. But here, uh, what one of the other things is. Um, with, with with this scope, uh, we've had you know wonderful donations uh, through uh, Bob Drew and uh, Mike Noble. Uh, you know these sort of ethos eyepieces, and it's you know you know so like okay, what I you know it's like thirteen is too low. No, no, eight. And it's like, do we do we have the five? Yeah, yeah. Let's put on the five. And and of course with these hundred degree field, it, it's like uh, uh, the the um, we we go out telling people. Uh, uh, it, it sounds like the you know the the big fish that I that I didn't catch. It was this big, <laughs> and you sort of look in, and, and you're you're practically you know turning your head to look at the star, and just come all the way down the dust lane, and and turn your head to see the other edge of the field. It, it's it's like wow, <laughs> it's it's a, a an amazing object to see in, in that scope. And again, it's just like oh, time's up, move on. But 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 but. You know, somebody else's turn. Uh, so, what is the uh, focal length? So, what's your magnification with a five? Um, I don't know offhand, uh, but it sounds like three hundred and fifty something yeah. like that. Uh, oh. it, and and it, it's deceiving with the extra wide field eyepieces as well, because <laughs> sort of you can be really you can be even more power, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Laurie has a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. hundred and twenty-eight inch uh, focal length. Okay. Yeah, thirty-two inch f four. Right. Whatever that turns out to millimeters. And... Okay, uh, Lori. Yeah. Hi, Esther. Um, I wanted to know about the little fuzzy blob that's down, like above above the galaxy. Um, like yep. a, oh. yes, exactly right there. What's that lovely little thing? Uh, uh, PGC eight six twenty five ninety three four or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. 
Yeah, I have oh. no idea. It's some okay. background galaxy that will have some pretty obscure uh, designation. Um, I I don't recall anybody saying, "Hey, did you see this thing in the background?" Um, but it, it's one of those things that, especially looking through a large telescope, uh, you take notes. You whatever notes you can. You come back. You look at say a reference picture and go. Oh, we got to go back and try for this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, how far away is this galaxy? Um, it would probably be in the 40 million light years. Yeah, okay. 40 million plus or minus. Uh, 20? 20 million. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Hey, it's, thanks, thanks, Alistair. For it's not terribly far, but it's not terribly close either. Um, oh, uh, next, please. Yeah, so uh, Stefan's right. Quintet um, is, is another one of those uh, objects that uh, deep sky observers, once you're really hooked on galaxies, is, is that you go for. And, and again, I've tried to, um, you know, change, play with contrast with a, 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 an image rather than a sketch to try and, and, and give an idea of what it looked like. And um, a, a number of us is like, we're disappointed. It's just like, I've seen it better in a in a 16 inch scope. And so maybe we had air glow. Uh, Edmonton is uh, in, in the uh, auroral glow where sometimes mm -hmm. it's just beyond that uh, limit of uh, detectability. But we also have, um, upper atmospheric air glow bands that go by. So maybe when we were looking at it, we had some of that. We're not really sure. Uh, some of it is, uh, could be, it's a 32 inch scope. It's collecting a lot of light. Uh, and so maybe um, we're gonna try uh, to throw on just a, a gentle broadband filter that just mm. tries to cut out some of that stuff and maybe uh, uh, squeeze out uh, some better contrast. So I have not yet heard of, of uh, whether or not that's successful, but we're going there. For those who don't know about how Aurora affects Edmonton, <laughs> I can remember being out near this site in the middle of winter when it's supposed to be as dark as it gets and reading a newspaper by the <laughs> yeah. yeah, It can get really bright at times. And quite often you'll go out there and they'll it will look like it's perfectly clear until you put your eye to the eyepiece and you'll see that there's some haze there. We get a lot, and a little less since the North Magnetic Pole has moved off of it. But, yeah, um, yeah, but, but you're, you're at the mercy of, yeah. the, of that. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully we will get one where it's like, oh, this is there. I mean, we were able to see all five components um, and even the sixth off to the side there, and you can see that the central two there, you can see that they're split, but it was just the, I should be able to see more. So we're, we're hoping. Um, but yeah, we, I, 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 I've actually, um, not this year, but at other times, uh, driving out to the dark site and the aurora comes up and it's just like, I'm, I'm going home. This is pointless. I've actually had times where you've got that, you know, the nut, that nice green arc where it's dark below. And that's where I'm observing is in the, in the lower 15 degrees below the arc because the rest of the sky is just, it's as if I was in the city. It's just, but it's aurora and it's a sheet that just sort of sits there and, yeah. does nothing, <laughs> barely <laughs> nothing. Even on a good night, the best I've seen that in my 10 inch, it was just the soft glow. You couldn't distinguish the individual pieces. Yeah. So who knows? Uh, but yeah, uh, like I have a um, one of the filters um, from, uh, it's not a botter, uh, but it's, it's called, um, uh, it's a, a sky glow filter, so it it actually knows what the uh, th those upper atmospheric air bands are, not just aurora. So it it cuts out, it has a dip uh, for the aurora and the sky glow band, and then it has a you know jump window for uh, oxygen three and H beta. 
So, uh, you know, uh, and then more in the blue as well. And so hopefully that will, will help for some of these uh, objects. Uh, next, please, David. Uh, yeah, M33. Uh, it was funny. I remember uh, I, I was in the dome and there was just a, 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 a three or four of us, five of us maybe. And it was, you know, what next? What next? I go, M33. And someone said, oh, it, you know, it's a low surface brightness. You're not going to really... So, you know, let, let, let's let's have a look. I, like I've had some nice looks at it. And so again, here I've played with the contrast, I've desaturated it. Uh, and, and you sort of look in and go, oh yeah, it is low surface brightness, low contrast. And then it's like, oh, 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 oh my. There's stuff everywhere. You know, like there, there's no place in the eyepiece that hasn't got some measure of detail, but it's all, in the background, and, and you know, so the next person went up, and well, I didn't wait for it, and then you hear them go, "Oh, okay, now I see." Yeah, and it's just <laughs> yeah, stuff. <Cool. laughs> um, yeah, again, you know, truly remarkable uh, being able to, and and you can see that the main S shape of the spiral arm, yeah, and, but it's that it's not it it doesn't hit you in the face. It's not a standout object. It's not going to impress a brand new observer, uh, but it's someone who's actually looked for it and tried to see things. To them, it'll go, oh, yes, okay. Now I see. Uh, like I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the central area of uh, the Whirlpool galaxy because I've seen Hubble shots and you just see all this detail of you know spiral banding right into the core. So it's like, oh, I, I'm looking really forward to, to seeing that. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, uh, so of course, right after that, it's the, uh, you know, okay, what next one? It goes like, oh, Andromeda has star clouds. Now, we also know that there's globular clusters in Andromeda, which we can see, uh, but someone is still sort of uh, accumulating the list of, uh, and. Uh, and so that we'll be able to sort of do a tweet. We're actually planning um, that we'll, we'll have a thing where when someone is up at the eyepiece, there'll be a, okay, core of M31, then the star cloud, then globular cluster G5 or whatever, and jump around or dust lane this. Um, so uh, you know, we will be able to do that. So yeah, um, you know, the star cloud is like, yep, that's a star cloud, all right. And then you you sort of you're looking in the eyepiece and you see off to the side like you do in this uh, picture, just like, oh, the core is just there. And just like, oh, pass me the, uh, the 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 hand paddle, will you? And so you get in, just like, boop, 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 boop. and uh, next uh, slide, please. And so you get right into the core uh, mm. of the galaxy, and it's just this super bright stellar dot and and stuff. Um, and then it, uh, the, the on the right, it's uh, it's uh, uh, the 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 curves of what the human eye is is capable of seeing. Scotopic vision, um, the the tall one. I'm not sure why they quite show the curves like that, but at any rate, you see very little red, and you quickly lose stuff going into the that's violet. All, that's all rods. Yeah, uh, but the but the outer part, I mean, you're detecting green, but you don't see green. However, a big telescope, a bright object, uh, as I said to Roman at one point, did, did we leave the filter in from the last uh, object? And he goes, no, 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 I got the filter here. Because it's green. The Andromeda galaxy is green. <laughs> And it's just punk, uh, you know. It's and again that that sort of um, it, you know similar to the green that you know when aurora gets bright enough, you go, oh, yeah, that's that's not gray anymore. That that's green. So that that, that was a, a really kind of you know head bending uh, experience seeing that. And just like, you, you just expect to see what you see in pictures. They sort of. The, the population two yellow orange stars 
in, into the middle uh, and brighter. It's like, nope, it's green. <laughs> um, and it's, it's stimulating the cones of your retina. Yeah. It takes a fair bit of light to break the dark sky. Exactly, yeah. You, you need throughput to actually sort of see that. So, uh, of course, then it's the, oh, well, if we're seeing this, what's, uh, what's the Orion Nebula like? So, next slide. Um, oh, sorry, before, just before the Orion Nebula, as we get there, uh, it's also the question of, so what color is hydrogen, ionized hydrogen? And the uh, image on the left is Wikipedia. This is what an, a hydrogen discharge uh, tube produces. It's this sort of almost hot pink. It's, it's not red. Now, hydrogen alpha is red, but when you also combine hydrogen beta, which is just on, on the blue side of the green ionized oxygen, then ion, um, hydrogen gamma is into the blue, which visually at night we don't see, during the day we can, and that combines to that. So if our eyes were uh, capable of seeing full color at night, things like the Barnard's loop would be uh, pinky purple, <laughs> not, uh, not red uh, as we see it there. So that's just sort of something to leave in the back of your mind here. So uh, next, please. So the central part of, of the Orion Nebula um, is uh, just, it's, it's remarkable. Again, it's the, oh, there, there's just detail coming at you. It's just, uh, uh, outstanding, and it's very green, very, very green. Uh, and again, the, the trapezium punching through there. Um, and, and so it's the, so what else is there? And, and just like, you know, how are the wings? Well, part of it is, again, magnification. You're not seeing the, the whole thing at all. You're, you're, you're really right in close. And so um, the, 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 Picture on the right is uh, is actually semi infrared, so it, it doesn't it's not really fair, but it kind of gives you an idea and you think, oh, maybe I'll start seeing some of that uh, pink. And uh, well, I can only tell you my experience. Uh, everybody's color sensitivity is slightly different, and again, there's a difference where uh, or to note and remember that your peripheral vision, your averted vision. There's no color at all. It's it's all shades of gray. It's only the central color, uh, uh, part of your eye, uh, right in in the fovea centralis that can detect color. I mean, you do have cones smattered about uh, peripherally as well. But it's so to see color, you really need to look at something. Um, and so uh, you know, here you are with this thing, you know, pouring out light, pouring out of the eyepiece. Um, and uh, it's like that central area is green. And then, oh, there's a wing over here is gray. And then, then this part is, is, is not green. It's not gray. It's, it, it's not pink. It's, uh, and it's like, what is that? Um, and to my eyes, it was sort of a muddy purple, brownie purple. Uh, uh, and and so that, that that's uh, that's what I got out of it, uh, and I've seen it twice now, and it's just, and I had the same kind of reaction. To me, a brownie purple. Uh, to you, maybe something different. Uh, I hear women can see red much better uh, at the at the low levels, so maybe it's uh, it'll be uh, 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 really interesting to hear uh, uh, what they have to say about it. So um, I believe that might be the last one. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, the the only thing that you know, a, a taste of that just wants makes you want to go back for more and more uh, and and more time at the eyepiece because uh, it's uh, it it's tough to you know you you sort of we don't have a timer for two minutes uh, but you you go up you look. You're impressed, and then it's like, okay, there's you know, 30 other people wanting to look oh, as well. So you get yeah. 30 people at a time up there. 
Sometimes, yeah. Well, at the star party, and and, and I mean, this yeah. is even at midnight. Earlier on, I don't know how many people there were. We 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 had, I think, uh, uh, close to ninety people at at the star party in September. So probably at at you know at nine p.m. there were you know eighty of them, at, at, and so there there's. Yeah, uh, you know, a greeter at the gate. There's uh, um, the the 18 inch Barry Arnold Memorial Telescope for uh, entertaining people okay. while they're waiting Wait. in line. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's an amazing scope. So thank you very much, Bob, for uh, having kick started the whole thing and 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 pushed. Uh, it's uh, it's really remarkable. So, Alistair, have you had other public nights so far, or has it been the star party so far? Um, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the, there has been a public night outside of the star okay. party. So you... oh, oh, yeah, and the, there's been uh, a scout group that went up. Right. They were uh, very impressed with the moon. Mm. Uh, and, and, of course, yeah, you know, Dave's reaction there to say like, what are you wasting the scope so, on the moon for? yeah you looked at one crater and that it is it is impressive yeah but i can't say that smells more than me yeah. <laughs> yeah i guess you can't see anything else no that's is. the problem um, yeah. you know I, you know i wouldn't show you more than what a a, a 12 or 18 inch scope oh, would yeah. show you on the moon but uh, you know, and so it, it it it's it's sort of humbling to try and uh, you know to hear that sort of feedback. Wow, the moon was incredible. <laughs> you know, it's not why we built this. No. You know, and, and you know, uh, something like the veil, which just totally is mind blowing. It's like, eh. It's interesting to see you during the Saturday because. Uh, are there any other questions that anybody has uh, about this? Okay. Dave, can you speak up? Alistair, I can add to that. Uh, is my audio on? Yep. Yes, it is. Uh, the, pro the project is still at the commissioning stage where the equipment is uh, being fine-tuned for function, uh, such as uh, tying in rotation of the dome with the uh, uh, information on the, on the star locations and uh, the, the eyepiece choices and everything. Uh, I, I did get three brief evenings uh, last September, uh, as I mentioned, but the scope uh, and anything in Alberta for all the reasons, including low uh, uh, aurora, is uh, if you have a bright sky, you lose your contrast. So 891 on a medium-sized scope in uh, the Edmonton region uh, can be pretty, uh, not poor, you don't see it dynamically or, or and so forth. So... Uh, and as far as objects go, Warren, who did some observing, and a few other people who have caught some, uh, so the good news on it uh, from critical observers like Denis Bouchard, who has one of Barry Arnold's 16 inch as a, a competent, he just found that optically it was great on star images and high power. And Warren uh, in testing after the beginning, of course, was a veil impressing everybody uh, as, as Barry, as uh, well, uh, Alistair said, but uh, they also caught the uh, twin tw recently, the twin quasar in, in uh, Ursa Major. And uh, when I caught it with a smaller scope a long time ago, barely detecting it. But uh, he, they saw the two components, but it's an interesting one. I don't think it's quite as, I'm not sure uh, whether it's uh, 16, 17 or a low 18, but it's barely detectable on the 20 on perfect scene. But the interesting thing about it is the CFH telescope had uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, experiments done on uh, with Canadian observers, uh, and it had the two components with the uh, they were gravitationally lensed, and the light was so it, one had a longer path, and there was a measurable time between the two images. So it was an interesting one. But now they're saying it's 17 or 18 mag. Back then, I thought it was 16, 7. It's a, it, just for the idea that you're looking at something older than the Earth and is gravitationally lensed to prove the uh, you've seen the phenomena. But the last comment I had is a large scope is sensitive to a bright sky for contrast. Uh, but on the power and the image, it looks like uh, 
were well set up to go forward with it and finish the commissioning, including, for example, Roman built, it's a, um, totally adjustable to put in another focuser. It's got a very sturdy tertiary. You can take a three inch focuser <coughs> and turn it into another eyepiece set or sort of for a photography and you got to pick or the rotator and the filter wheel. If people want to go that way, they're leaving the club to see where they want to divide. They're going to start with visual and public as you observing. So that's just a broad picture. I think Alistair, you gave a good sample of what it's capable of and uh, the privilege for anybody will be to be there on a dark night and uh, putting aside the upcoming uh, eclipse, I, I would think uh, the time to use that scope would be the realm of the heavens in the, uh, March, April, uh, when in a dark sky, there's just so many things to see in the coma cluster and everything else. Uh, no more. Th thanks for your uh, information, Alistair. Enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, and thanks again to David for uh, being uh, the page turner. <laughs> yeah, th thank you very much, Alistair. That was a great presentation. Um, the the um, internet from you folks was full of some excitement with images, especially from the VCO. Uh, I believe on the 16th, um, I, since we're on a roll with, with pictures, uh, is there anybody who has any pictures that they wanted to share, either from the 16th or in the last week or so when the skies have been uh, quite clear? I could show a couple to start. Yeah, go for it. Do you have your famous uh, moon sketch? Yep. Okay, but I have to find it where I put my Zoom. I have too many windows open. There we go. And share, 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 screen. So one of the delights that night, so this was Saturday, two nights ago, was watching Alistair at work. Because, um, you know, I was focused on one object, as you could imagine, because usually... It's not a nice moon night when when people decide to open the VCO. So I was in my element. But Alistair, you know this guy so well, and you were hopping all over the place and showing off things. And, and to see the excitement and the excitement that you had with the 32-inch, uh, because you know this guy so well, that that is... There's nothing like watching somebody who really knows this guy hopping around. And you were doing a great job that whole that whole evening. That that was because I I'm not even quite sure what was going on inside the uh, the um, not the dome, but you know, or the observatory. I think uh, Reg was that was really keen on watching the moon also most of the evening. But I was outside on the twenty inch, and Alistair was on. Was it a ten? I think it ten. Seems like it. Oh no! Somebody said it was a twelve. I, that's a 12. I think yeah, I think it's a twelve actually. Anyway, the other thing is I, um, so at the buy and sell in November, was it from you, Dave, that I bought the iApton, the the camera tracker? Yeah. So it was my first time with a clear sky with that, and so without careful alignment, just you know, I just pointed it north and set the the um the latitude and i put my little camera on with a 40 millimeter and uh set it for a minute and i got the uh the comet just beautifully without any without any trouble i took another picture of it um here with a bit more context so so there it is down there oh <laughs> But but it's kind of fun. I I I I put it with the little weather station there on purpose to to just give you a better idea of what what it looked like. But that that was a minute tracking without any problem, and uh, first time just out of the box. Even the batteries that you had in there were still good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was it was lovely seeing the the comet. And then um, Miles found it. He, he actually was the first person of the cohort up there. He found it in the 20 inch 
the obsession. And uh, it was really very, very clear. No, no ambiguity of what you were looking at. I don't know that I saw color. It really was, to my eye, it was not colored, but you can see in uh, the photograph that it has a very distinct color. And if you haven't looked at the astronomy photo of the day for today of the comet, it's just remarkable. It's got a kind of a red spiral because the, the nucleus is spinning around and I don't know what it is that's red coming out of it, but um, maybe somebody can pull that up. Anyway, um, so yeah, I haven't had quality time on the 20-inch uh, obsession uh, before. It's always been too windy or there's always been a good excuse. But um, there, there's Reg and Miles and a big treat as well as the amazing telescope is Miles lent us his um, Teleview Ethos uh, 21 millimeter eyepiece. So super wide view, which meant that you don't have to keep moving the telescope. It, 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 that was, because I also used my normal uh, eyepiece uh, and it was really fun having that much more magnification, but um, it, it was, you know, it's a very small field of view and there's no tracking on this thing. You have to keep pushing it. So when I actually got to sketching, and I'm really pleased with uh, this picture. So I, I set my sketching table up on the stepladder. And uh, I think I was certainly at that for more than half an hour. I didn't time how long I was, I was doing my sketch. Uh, but it wasn't that uncomfortable. I waited until the moon got down low enough that I could do it from the second and not from the third step. So um, that was much more comfortable then, but it was, it was, it worked very, very well. And, uh, oh dear, where do I have the photo? Um, I think the best thing would be for me to go to my, uh, oh no, I think I did put it in now, you know what? I'm just going to go to Facebook. I'm going to go to Facebook because that's where I know I have it. Sorry, guys. There's there's stuff in the way on my screen, so I have to move this. I don't know how to do this. It's because of the, the top of the screen. I'm lost. Randy, I have it if you want me to share. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing because. Um, I'll, I'll just pull it up. That'd be great. Sorry about that. At, and I have a pod when you're done as well. You want to see the comment? Absolutely. Let me just get this up. So the other the other treat is uh, Mike Nash has been doing his magic, and so this is a super blow up. Th this was Friday night from home. Okay, so uh, this is an area just south of uh, what the Mare Fecundatis. Um, it's a rather complicated area, but I really really like it because I love. Craters in craters, sub craters, and so uh, this this area was rich in it. Um, but the picture on the right was Mike Nash at the same time from his driveway, and uh, you know he had the whole moon, and I've just blown up a piece of it. But it, it's really lovely to to see the comparisons, and th there's some things that. Um, you see better in the eyepiece and some things you see better in the photo. It's just like that. Okay, do you have the picture from Saturday night too? I did post that. This was the only picture I had um, uh, up, Randy. Okay, 
Anyway, th there is another one and I probably could figure it out, but that's okay. Uh, sketching from the 20 inch though was, was a treat and thank you for everybody else leaving me alone up there for a long time. <laughs> Super. Um, did, did you want? Did you have one of the um, of the of the comment? Yeah, I've I've got a pod, and I also have uh, Dan in his uh, 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 cold fueled super. He um, managed to capture the comment as well. So uh, I'll I'll show the a pod, and then I'll show uh, Dan's. So there's the there's the apod. Uh, uh, Randy, is this the red thing that you were yeah. talking about? Yeah. So yeah. they figure out that the the nucleus is spinning around, <laughs> and the stuff is coming out. You know, as it's moving as it's moving forward. But wow, hey, it looks it looks like one of those colored uh, pinwheels. I think it's narrow band. I don't think it's false color. Oh really? Mm. Do they have an explanation, or does it? Yeah, they talk about it. Well, I, I remember in Elbach, we had a public observing session, and I had my eight-inch scope, and it wasn't driven. So every so often, I had to stick my head to the eyepiece and, and reposition it. And I could see, like a long sprinkler, with common nucleus going around and moving these little spiral arms. So every every half minute, I'd see it rotate a little bit, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. it was yeah, he, he, he says uh, the person's... Uh, who, who did who, who did this said that uh, it's three specific wavelengths, I guess, and he's kind of mapped them for this. Oh, oh, it is false. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, th this one is uh, Dan's. Ooh. Hmm. That that was the Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where it was with that hockey stick uh, asterism. I'm not sure what this is. Do, does anybody know what this is? Yeah, that's Miroc Beta Andromeda. Ah, right, right. Wow, so the tail at least extends to there. So th that's the Andromeda galaxy on the right? Uh, yep. On the left. Yeah. I don't know what this one is here. This is Andromeda for sure. There's 110. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But yeah, you look you look at this, you can see the ion jet. The other galaxy is um triangulum, I think. Yeah. Yeah, M oh, they're that close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think you're right. It's M33, is it? Or yeah. I, I think Andromeda is due to eat um the, the triangulum before it merges with the Milky Way. Yeah, and he complained yeah. that he, he he gave all sorts of excuses why it wasn't that good. <laughs> he it's, only it's had really, he only really had fifteen wonderful. minutes. He said he only had fifteen minutes. Yeah, but that's his super fast lens. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cheating, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's re it's really really wide field. Yeah, it is. It is. It's the. I think it's the. That sigma, I think it's like a, is it like a 1.4 or something like that? 105, yeah. 1.4? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, if there's anybody else uh, with a picture or wants to try to think about pulling one up, I've got a brief uh, presentation that I can uh, put in now um, and you can perhaps uh, search for your photos. Um, when I was looking at um, things to see what would be interesting to talk about today. We, we just, uh, let me just pull this up. There we go. Can you see that okay? Yes. The screen is here. Trying to get the screen out of the way. There we go. Good. So we had a um, a leap year um, uh, this year. Uh, 
uh, February was the was the additional day, and uh, just doing some reading about it. Um, you know, a lot of little gems came out that I thought I'd, I'd just share. So a lot of this is going to be pretty basic for, for most people, but bear with me because there's some, some interesting little bits. So the, the standard version of leap year is that the, uh, the, the, the year is actually 365 and a quarter days, so that every four years we make it up. We make up by additional day. And that becomes the leap year. But of course, it's not quite that simple. I'm going to just move this again. Good. Uh, maybe not. There we are. So a common year, which is what we usually talk about as, as you know, the standard year, 365 days or 52 weeks plus one day. So where does the leap year get its name from? Any given date in a year will occur on the next day of the following year next day of the week of the following year so in a leap year the addition of an extra day means that any given date will leap over by an additional day so hence a leap year uh 366 days but a solar year which is actually what we're talking about is actually 365 days five hours 48 minutes and 46 seconds it's also called a tropical year or year of, or of the seasons it's actually the time between two successive occurrences of the vernal equinox, which is when, of course, the sun crosses the celestial equator moving north. So you, you remember that from previously. There's the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox occur, of course, a half year apart. And then and you have... Jeff, the, yes. The vernal equinox will happen exactly 24 hours less four minutes from now it's exactly right it's coming up in another in another day it's at i think it's at uh 808 tomorrow actually so we're just, just we're one day away from it coincidence could have waited four <laughs> minutes and then said it was exactly <laughs> well by the time i finish if you want to do a countdown that's no awesome. i think we're past it i think we just missed it so, so the 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 other kind of year we have is the sidereal year, which is actually 365 days, six hours, nine minutes, and ten seconds. So it's actually a little bit longer than the solar year, which is which is unusual, but the the uh, unusual because of the counterclockwise rotation um, of the Earth. But it's actually because of the precision, the the um wobble of the earth on its axis so we'll come to that later because it's got some some further significance leap years were introduced by julius caesar in the julian calendar at that time leap years were every four years and occurred without fail but that of course overcompensated and was not particularly useful if you were trying to line the year up with the seasons so that was altered in um I believe the 16th century um, and became the Gregorian calendar devised by an Italian astronomer named after Pope Gregory, replaced the Julian calendar, had much, much stricter criteria for leap years. And this is what we use now uh, as, as our calendar. So the Gregorian calendar said that all years can be, that can be divided by four are leap years, except for century years, unless they can be divisible by 400. So some some century years will be leap years, and every every fourth every fourth century year will be a leap year, but the rest will be misses as leap years. The skipped leap year or the skipped leap years account for the fact that we're overcompensating by adding a day every four years. So to break it down, you've got leap years at three hundred and sixty six days, tropical years, which is our typical. Um, year 365 days, 365.24 days, and then common years, which are, th which are 365 days. So math shows that over four years, the difference between the calendar year and the solar year isn't exactly 24 hours, it's 36, or 23 hours, 0.26222 hours. Adding in a, a leap year every four years, we overcompensate. We have to adjust that by skipping some leap years. And, and by convention in the Gregorian cal calendar, we skip the century years, except if they're divisible by 400. But sidereal year is longer. 
sidereal year is longer because of the precision, the, the, the wobble on the Earth's axis. It's, it follows a 25,000 year, 25,800 year cycle. Uh, the precision is about a 50 seconds a year. So it's got two ramifications, one in astrology and one more importantly in the equatorial coordinate axis system that we use. For astrology, the vernal equinox is known, was known as the first point of Aries and it still, it still is, but that was 2000 years ago. And the point of the vernal equinox actually now occurs in Pisces, so that any astrologic projection is actually one uh, constellation off. And this is this is the constellations that it, it includes Apiacus, which is of course not included as one of the zodiac signs. But if <laughs> if if um, if the equinox was in uh, Aries, it's now in Pisces, so it's off one. So when I read my uh, my horoscope, I'm a Leo, but I should be reading Cancer. More importantly, though, in the equatorial coordinate system, uh, we have epochs. We're we're now in the uh, J2000 epoch, and because of the wobble and the fact that things change, the the the, the um, a sidereal a relationship changes slightly every year. It's updated every 50 years. So in 2050 we'll have an update to the coordinate system. So different, different calendar systems have dealt with the um, length of the year in different ways. Chinese calendar has a leap year featuring leap months rather than leap days. And that would be partly because it's a uh, lunar, uh, lunar calendar uh, adding an additional month. The Hindu leap year features in the, an extra month as well. The Ethiopian calendar has 13 months, where the 13th month has five days in the common year and six in the leap year. So they, addition, they add the additional day that way. Oh. Islamic leap year occurs 11 times in a 30-year cycle. Um, that's also based on a lunar calendar. The Jewish leap year is, was actually the most fascinating. Um, between 383 and 385 days, in a leap year, with the leap year occurring seven times in a 19-year cycle. It typically has, it's, it's a lunar calendar, but it's solar linked. It's typically got 12 months alternating between 29 and 30 days, with a 30-day leap year added every seven to nine, every on, added seven times in 19 years. In terms of the accuracy of the leap calendars, the Gregorian calendar that we use is is actually about the fourth most accurate. It's um, out by one day every 32, 36 years. So there should be a correction coming in the year 2794. <laughs> Don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure we're around for that. Um, the Mayan calendar is the next most accurate. Uh, it was created about 2000 uh, BC. Margin of one day in in 6,500 years, it's it's a complicated calendar. I looked at it, and I, I, I'm not going to try to explain it. it. It it has two revolving cycles of 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 years. The revised Julian calendar, which actually came out in the 20th century, um, is competition with the Gregorian calendar. But of course, we use the Gregorian calendar. It has adjusted, adding the additional day a little bit more accurately. Um, so years evenly divisible by 100 are not leap years, except years with remainders of 200 or 600 when divided by 900. <laughs> but it's got a margin of error one day in 31,250 years. The Iranian calendar, which is really based on uh, astronomic observation, it corrects to the, to the um, uh, um, a vernal equinox. Um, they say is out only one day in 110,000 years, but I actually oh, yeah. I couldn't see why it would be out if it kept uh, adjusting to the to the equinox, unless it's because of the the wobble of the Earth. But uh, those are the the leap years. We're we're left with the algorithm here. So if we can divide by four, it's a leap year in unless it's divisible by 100, unless that, that is divisible also by 400. 
And that is the summary of our leap years. Any questions or comments? Well, just to point out that we had the exception when they're having had lived through 2000, right? Where the, we had a double zeros, a double zero year that was a leap year. That's correct, because it, it was, was because it was visited by, by 400 as well. Oh, that's a good point. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be back to regularity when we live through 2100. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, will, will the Milankovitch cycle... I'm sorry? Will the Milankovitch cycle mess this all up? Go ahead, David, explain that. It's the, it's the pull of Jupiter on the Earth changes its uh, orbit, and it's it's uh, it's it's uh, direction of orbit changes, and its eccentricity changes. Dave, you... I think the precession is one of the is one of the Milankovitch cycles. I think. Okay. But yeah, the, the the other ones. I didn't know it was Jupiter, though. Well, it's over thousands of years, but I think it's the influence of Jupiter on yeah. our, our orbit. Yeah, it's 140,000. Pardon me? Is it 40,000 years? 140,000. I think it's something like 40, 60, and 100. There are three cycles, like you said. Yeah. Anyways, and I think the one that Jeff was talking about was one of those. In terms of precision, you mean? The precession is one of the Milankovitch cycles, I think. Yes, yes. Interesting. Well, thank you, David. Um, so in the interim period, has anybody come up with any other photos that they wanted to share? Um, from, I guess, in the last week or so. Okay. Um, is there anybody who has any announcements then uh, to, to make? Yeah, I, I, I actually have one. Uh, normally, we would have a makers group uh, this Thursday, uh, but I think um, Jim just came back from vacation and He's unwell from this cold that's going around. So I think we're going to skip this month and um, next month we'll do makers. Okay. So this Thursday is actually Sunday for the makers. <laughs> it's a leap year. A leap day. I'd like to say that the Astro Cafe next week will have a talk from a former student of mine, Callie Selmus, who is one of the operators of the MMT telescope from uh, very south of Arizona. Um, I think she's one week on, one week off or something like that. And anyway, she's coming up to visit some friends next week. So she's agreed to give us a talk about what it's like operating a major facility and um, I gather, Gary, it was it's close to where your old branch was. Yes, I can see it from my house. You can see it. Yeah, it's a long so, ways away, but I can see it. Anyway, um, she's had the job now for about a year, and she loves it. And so, um, I'll give you a secret: is that her boss said she could show off anything as long as she doesn't show off any clouds above the uh above the observatory so we'll only see clear skies um and i think uh dave will also be talking about his arizona trip so we'll have a double arizona um whammy next next week that'll be a geographic concentration <laughs> Lori, do you have a question um i would just like to just uh, say that we do have a, um, a Friends of the DAO Star Party on the 23rd, which is this coming Saturday night. Um, it still will be a little earlier, so we're starting at 6.30 and going till 10. Uh, we know that the time has changed, but um, we'll, we'll 
do the next one will be a little bit later. I don't know. I, I have a feeling that this lovely weather, you know, is going to totally deteriorate and we probably Aww. won't have anything on Saturday. Um, mm. But uh, but uh, you're welcome to uh, welcome to come up um, and uh, and help if there's if there's any clear skies, you know, please, please come on up and help um, people. We haven't had we haven't had very good luck at all this year of putting out telescopes and having people look through. It's been really rather, rather horrendous. Um, the other uh, the other thing uh, is just um, a very a quite sad note is that one of our um uh, quite long-standing um, FDO volunteers. Uh, some of you may have may recognize him as Mark Ledahowski, who is a um, person who is up has been up for quite a long time. She and he and Susan um, had two girls, and they came up quite even before the pandemic, and they were only in their teens, and they would they would come up and volunteer. And their daughter Caroline um, um, died this past week, Aww. and um, uh, just. I, I think fairly suddenly. And uh, so we've just, we've just found out about that. So it's been a, it's been a bit of a shock for everybody. So we'll let anybody, we'll, we'll let you know any more information that we have, but some of you may have, uh, have known Mark. So, okay. That's all I have for now. Okay. Thanks for it. So, just looking around, uh, any any further comments or or items uh, coming up for anybody? Okay, um, well it's it's eight thirty. Um, it's been good to see everybody, um, and um, I guess we'll get together again next week. Take care and have a nice evening.